Christian was born on January 29th, 1920, on his family farm in Haynes, North Dakota, to Albert Murray and Naomi Burl Christian. He had five sisters and four brothers. Merlin, one of the smartest people you'll ever meet, actually dropped out of school in ninth grade to go work on the farm. However, knowing the importance of education, he worked diligently to get his GED several years later. At the age of 17, he joined his friends in the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps. And after working with them for about a year, he returned home. He was one of the hardest working men you would ever meet. In his early years, he worked as a ranch hand in the coal mines and even thin sugar beets in North Dakota and Montana. Who even knows what that is? <laughs> but he made many lifetime friends during that time. In 1941, at the age of 21, Merlin joined the Navy and became a ship's cook. And man, could he cook. In 1943, he met and married a little cutie named Vivian June Harmison. They started married life off in Minnesota and moved to Spokane where he worked repairing B-17 bombers that were damaged in World War II. Merlin and Vivian started their family in Spokane with the birth of their first daughter, Kaylee. They later moved to Tennessee for a short amount of time when Merlin attended a Bible college, worked at an automobile dealership, raised a family, and overall perfected his awesomeness. In 1948, another child was born to the Christian family, and his name was Gary. Right after Gary's birth, Merlin's oldest brother passed away. His brother had been the heir to the Christian family farm in North Dakota. After his death, Merlin moved his family back to the Dakotas to take over the day-to-day -day operations of the farm. He farmed for the next several years, and in addition to farming, he drove back and forth to Detroit buying and selling cars. He also sold life insurance, and Vivian used to always say that these many jobs were just to support his hobby, the farm, which he loved. He almost loved it as much as he adored his family. Merlin really wanted one more child, but Vivian wasn't too excited about having a third baby after nine years. And she said she would only agree if Merlin sweetened the pot and threw in a few appliances for her. <laughs> her negotiation tactics worked, and in 1956, Gerenda was born. Eventually, Merlin and Vivian moved to Washington State, where he would semi-retire. His plan was to farm the summers in North Dakota and spend the winters in Washington. However, we all know that semi-retirement for Merlin was just a pit stop on your way to taking it easy town. And he officially retired in 1976. And boy, did they know how to take it easy. They traveled all over the United States, seashore to seashore, in their motorhome, enjoying sights, friends, and family along the way. Over several decades, Merlin and Vivian had this awesome group of grandchildren. <laughs> and this is the point where uh, Merlin was rechristened Papo, which was apparently Lynette's fault, and we couldn't be happier. And we can't continue to describe Papo's life without adding some of our favorite Papo memories. <laughs> so let's start with Lynette. She spent most of her teenage years every summer on their farm. When she entered college, her trips were more infrequent as other responsibilities became priority. She always enjoyed her lunches with Papo, though, and after one lunch, he noticed her cute shoes and new purse, but completely bald tires. <laughs> he knew a girl had her priorities, but as Papo, he also knew she needed new tires. So by that very next weekend, she had a set. And they also bonded over their very strong love of all things chocolate. She, and pretty much everyone else, knew exactly where his not-so-secret stash was hidden. <laughs> In Lyric, she wanted to be his shadow, even if it meant hanging out at the truck stop for hours with him, chatting with other farmers, or going anywhere in that region. When someone would ask her, who do you belong to, darling? Well, being Merlin Christian's granddaughter, 
would always get an extra large slice of pie. When it came to Jason, Papo made him always feel like a superhero. He had this brown El Camino, and during his trips to the farm, Jason would beg Papo to take him to the mailbox, drop him off, and then let Jason race him back to the house on foot. Papa would roll his eyes and sigh and explain that Jason would never beat him. Then he would proceed to put the pedal to the metal and rev the El Camino to its max speed of five miles per hour <laughs> as Jason would victoriously speed by on foot and put that truck slash car slash automobile and mullet <laughs> and Papa to shame. For Jennifer, or Jenny Fart, as he liked to call her, True story. It would be getting left on the side of the road. Let me explain. Jennifer was having a nuclear meltdown in the car in the middle of nowhere. And there were no meds available back in the day to rem remedy this. But there was Papo. At Lyric Lynette's request, he stopped and dropped her off by the side of the highway and took off over the hill with Lynette and Lyric still in the car laughing. He was gone only a nanosecond, but it did the trick, and he returned to a sobbing Jennifer. <laughs> of course, he smirked and apologized, and Jennifer eventually forgave him only about six months ago. <laughs> For Landon, it could be the memory of leaving the city of Medora with Papo. Horn honking, lights flashing, speeding past a long caravan of cars filled with family members only to speed several miles ahead, pull over in the dark, turn the headlights off, let the caravan drive by, and then do it all over again, and again, and again. Finally, there's Bryson. He was the baby, so of course he got all the attention. <laughs> Papo attended every single one of his baseball or hockey games, church plays, or band concerts. Papo never missed one of Bryson's events. For several of the grandkids, we were fortunate enough to attend the Papo School of Driving, which included a smack to the back of the head with his left hand to correct every driving mistake. We all learned how to drive very quickly with this method of learning. <laughs> Papo loved young people. He loved to socialize. He loved Jesus. He loved Ronald Reagan, <laughs> and he loved his family, but not necessarily in that order. <laughs> and we also have to add, he loved asking you to look for the horse fly bit him. <laughs> if you don't know, ask Uncle Loyland, I think it got him too. <laughs> he was married for 57 years to our beautiful grandmother, Nanny. They settled in Arizona, but continued to travel in their motorhome for many years. All three of their children eventually moved to Arizona with grandkids and great-grandchildren showing up every few years. The size of their family grew to seven grandchildren and ten great-grandchildren. In 2002, Papa married the lovely Virginia and added three more children to his family along with seven grandchildren and one great-grandchild. She was such a blessing to his life, and we credit her with keeping him young. When they were married, they asked God to give them 10 years together, and that's exactly the blessing they received. They celebrated their 10-year anniversary last month. Thank you, Virginia. He loved you very much. Papa was preceded in death by his three parents. I'm sorry, parents. <laughs> he didn't have three parents. <laughs> but he did have three sisters, two brothers, and one grandchild. <laughs> okay. Oh, Merlin, loved by all, will be etched into his headstone. That perfectly sums up his life, yet only touches the tip of influence he had on the people who knew him. He is a child of God, loved by our Creator. 
But then he turned around and poured out that same unconditional love to all of us. And for that, we are eternally grateful. Everyone says that we should be thankful that we had almost 93 years with him. We are. But it still wasn't enough. We selfishly wanted more. So today, we say goodbye for now. But while you're waiting for us in heaven, say hi to the big giver.